A very good evening and hearty welcome to you all. We are going to start our program with a bandana performed by our fifth semester student, Rib Jyoti Sharma. <laughs> Namaskar. On behalf of the Department of Philosophy, Pandu College, I welcome you all to the periodic lecture series. The lecture series is being sponsored by Indian Council of Philosophical Research, related to ICPR for their kind support. We all know that the core of philosophy is an invitation to think, to speculate, to ponder about the deep questions of life and world. Keeping this in mind, we have chosen the title, the theme for this lecture series, Critical Thinking and Philosophizing. We are very fortunate to have three distinguished speakers to talk in the series. The first lecture will be delivered today by one of the distinguished scholars and revered teacher of philosophy, Professor Rohura Moraju from the Department of Humanities and Social Science of IIT Tirupati. We are immensely grateful to him for his kind consent to deliver the speech. Pandu College welcomes you, sir. Thank you. The second lecture will be delivered by Professor Nobokumar Hondikoi, former Dean and Professor of Dibrugar University on 28 December with title Moral Dilemma in Mahabharata. Professor Hondikoi is a renowned scholar in Sanskrit and Assamese. He received Hahito Academy Translation Award in 2019 for translating Kalhan's Raja Tarangini to Assamese. Pandu College welcomes you, sir. Thank you for being with us. The third lecture will be delivered by Dr. Shivani Sharma, Department of Philosophy, Punjab University, on 8th January 
2022 with title Philosophizing the Meaning of Meaning, Some Reflections. Personally, I was fortunate enough to attend some of her wonderful lecture. I think many of us, we have attended her lecture. So uh, she's a very dynamic person in the field of philosophy. Welcome ma'am to Pandu College and thank you for being with us. And we can see many lovers of wisdom among our uh, audience. So I once again, invite them to attend our lecture. I welcome all members in the audience consisting teachers, students, research scholars, and our well-researched in this program. And of course, I have to mention Mala Vaido and Shirin Vaido, our former SOD of the department and our senior teachers are also here. Our colleagues are also here. My sincere welcome to you all. Finally, I would like to welcome our patron, our principal, Dr. Zogesh Kakoti, sir, to inaugurate the program. Please, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vaidu. Good evening. Good evening to all of you. Namaskar. Our respected speaker, sir, Professor A. Raghura Maraju. Sir, namaskar. Uh, Professor Hendrik, sir, former dean of Dibrugar University. I, did, I had a contact uh, with him, frequent contact with him when I was in Guwahati University as academic register. Uh, perhaps uh, he will remember me. I respected Dr. Simani Sorma, Madam, Punjab University, Dr. Moitri Sorma, HOD, and all other faculty members of the Department of Philosophy, and our uh, retired professor, Malavaidu and all old and gold of our university, our, our college, and all the respected participants. Uh, actually, this is a very difficult and tough area for me. There are two aspects of the topic, critical thinking and philosophizing. Uh, perhaps uh, I may uh, follow very little uh, extent about critical thinking, but it is Philosophizing is a very, very difficult and tough for me. Uh, I can never follow the word philosophizing anyway. Uh, the uh, noted speaker, distinguished speaker, Professor Raghu Ramaraj will uh, clear everything to the participants. First of all, uh, we all feel honored by the gracious presence of the noted speaker, distinguished speakers, Professor Raghu Ramaraj, sir and his consent to deliver his speech today. The topic set for discussion is not only an interesting topic, but it is also an essential for each and every human being. In relation with humanity and nature, problem is always created due to lack of proper analysis, proper interpretation, proper inference, proper explanation, self-regulation, open-mindedness, and due to lack of problem-solving skill. There we feel the absence of critical thinking. I do not know the philosophical meaning of critical thinking. Simply, I know that critical thinking means making clear and reasoned judgment. Normally, we see that he or she is a person of critical thinking who is an open-minded, well-informed, and able to judge the quality of an argument and draw the cautious yet evidence-based conclusions. People of critical thinking are consistently rational, reasonable, and empathetic. They always strive for a quality life and excellence in thought. We are all aware that the National Education Policy 2020 has also emphasized on the syllabus and curriculum, which may arouse critical thinking in the minds of the students. Undoubtedly, it's a good initiative of the NEP 2020 after completing education, a student is always expected to raise vital questions and problems, formulating them clearly and precisely. He or she is always expected to be well versed in relevant information. The student after completion his degree or postgraduate degree or PhD degree, he is always or he or she is always expected to use abstract ideas to interpret it effectively and is expected to come to well-reasoned conclusions and solutions. And also, 
he or she is expected to test the efficacy of his her conclusion and solutions however anyway this is not my area of study what i have said is only my general ideas from the reading of piece of writings which available available in the google i hope everything will be clear from the discourse of the respected speaker sir so i want to stop here by declaring first lecture of the series inaugurated today thanks to the department of philosophy hod ma'am and all faculty members thank you all namaskar thank you sir today's lecture will be delivered by respected professor a raghuram raju and the title of his talk is problematizing two aspects in critical thinking the thinking that is criticized and the thinker criticizing i once again thank you sir and welcome to our college sir needs no introduction nevertheless i request my colleague dr moiri borman to give a brief account of his work accomplishment and achievement moiri please good evening sir good evening. on behalf of pandu college of department of philosophy i welcome you everyone it's a great honor and privilege great honor and privilege that professor raghuram raju is with us he is a professor of iit tirupati department of humanities and social science he has also served as a professor in central university of hyderabad for 28 years he has done his phd from iit kanpur regarding the research works his research works covers social political philosophy contemporary indian philosophy post modernism post colonialism bioethics and many more his publications more about 50 papers book reviews about 20 books newspaper articles radio talks on the art of desire in the writings of philosophy of vadera and sandidas and also about the philosophy of descartes he also have 24 papers in telugu language short stories book reviews in telugu language he has presented around 100 papers more than 100 papers in international conference he has also contributed in writing many books about existence experience ethics debates in indian philosophy classical colonial and contemporary enduring colonialism modernity in indian social theory philosophy and india and many more books he is also a member of different committees member advisory committee national library kolkata member of national council of rural institute ministry of human resource development member of iit tirupati member of review committee iscr and many more committees he has also involved in guiding many research students and mphil students lastly sir i want to say about professor ugram raju that will surprise us is that he has been also awarded as principal investigator that is content development for philosophy subject next award he also gave about the soys outstanding academic title 2007 for the book he has written debates in indian philosophy classical colonial and contemporary he has also been awarded as fellow indian institute of advanced studies simla 1993 he has also been awarded as advisor dilio studies in india thank you sir on behalf of pandu college department of philosophy i welcome you sir and request that you deliver your speech thank you sir uh, one announcement uh, sir one announcement uh, respected uh, speakers guests and all participants the program will be recorded so i hope you have no objection Yeah. the program will be recorded and kindly mute yourself okay sir yeah um, good evening and um, i thank dr maitrey sharma for this 
kind and generous uh, invitation. And I thank the principal of Pondu College, Dr. Yogesh Kakarni, for his kind words. And uh, I'm really impressed with the way in which I'm really warmed by, by Dr. Bayuri Burman's introduction about me. <coughs> Let me begin by uh, <coughs> getting not the meaning of the title that Dr. Maitri Sharma gave me to speak, but get at the essence of it. The meaning mm -hmm. of the topic that gave to me is that, you know, there is critical thinking and there is something which is very big achievement of human beings is being critical. Human beings are not born with critical thinking. Human being, history of human beings have been fraught with lot of orthodoxy, lot of conservatism, lot of oppression, where you have to obey what others say. We cannot question. Questioning would immediately uh, lead to punishment. And you have seen it in no less than the person of Socrates, who, when he started questioning, he was sentenced to death. So, and also in the case of uh, uh, Christ and many others. So questioning is not something which is natural to human beings in the history, in the beginning of the history. So human beings have to really work very, very hard to turn, to make a U-turn from obeying to questioning. So it's a, one of the major human achievements. So criticism is very important achievement of human, human beings historically. So that is something that I want to uh, submit at the outset. But the other way of turning this, course, this topic is, is there a trap in this engagement of questioning? Okay, when you ask people to be critical, do you, there are two possibilities. One is you want them to be radical. You want them to be radical. That's a very important point that I mentioned to you just now. But there is also a possibility where you can trap them and make them make critiquing, critical thinking a routine. I don't know whether it makes sense that there are two ways of looking at critical thinking. One, that you really start questioning things and get the best out of it. So that's a one way of understanding critical thinking. And I said that critical thinking is not something that came to human beings just like that. Many people have to fight very hard, lay their life, undergo suffering, and then achieve some place for critical thinking. But there is also a flip side to it, namely criticism can also become a habit. Criticism can also become an obsession. Criticism can also become a disease. And more importantly, criticism also can become a trap. So if you are really want, if you really wanted to uphold the essence of criticism or critical thinking, you have to safeguard yourself from relapsing into these aberrations I mentioned just now. 
never allow criticism to become a monotonous activity criticism to become a routine criticism to become an obsession criticism to become a disease if it becomes like that then it is not only not criticism it is exactly of opposite of all that is upheld in the name of criticism that's the first point that i want to make and it is in this context i want to look at the practices of philosophy in the west and the practices of philosophy in india okay when uh, when we look at the critical traditions in the west and we find that they are very rich and they are very progressive but suppose you use the same parameters of critical thinking in dealing with india is it possible to uphold the same kind of rigor is the question that i wanted to place before you so just to lay the uh, stage for uh, the presentation this is how i frame it and now i want to uh, it you know lay the foundation for the presentation you remember that socrates said that an examined life is not worth living okay and then he strongly recommended that examined life is the most important thing but then a problem with socrates or the greek metaphysics is they did not allow creative place for creativity because they thought that the only thing that human being can do is to discover which is already what is already there theories the forms which are you know the larger universals in plato's cosmology are fixed and they cannot be modified okay they are there and in fact the empirical reality is merely a shadow a photocopy a bad one at that of this ideal types so if ideal types are not amicable for change in ideal types of perfect and do not require change then what is left for philosophers philosophical thinking is nothing but discovering that which is already there discovering that which is already there so the place the human being plays within greek metaphysics is very minimal she or he unfortunately it is he not she adds nothing to the ideal types okay except to discover what is already there it is descartes who came up with a very interesting algorithm as a reaction to something that happened after socrates so what happened after the socrates is aristotle came up with the idea that whole is prior to parts and whole is more than parts however in politics he says that whole for conceptual reasons theoretical purposes can be disaggregated into a polity which is a whole can be disaggregated into communities communities into villages villages into communities communities into families families into pair and then he says pair cannot be further disintegrated disaggregated because one of the pair is man and woman and he says this is a biologist for excellence 
he says that two is the basic category because for one person to come into existence a man and woman should have come in sexual union so in aristotle two is most important thing so you begin with two you don't have a one so if you don't have one you cannot have individualism okay this is what descartes has dismantled and he said that we are not interested in two because that will implicate us into oppression so he said that we need to establish the i that's why you know there is this i think therefore i am so the centrality of individual comes with descartes and now you can see that critical thinking is at work at work in a in a fantastic way so in critical and then you have uh emmanuel kant who says that self is the only repository of knowledge self is the only repository of knowledge so the critical thinking of from socrates aristotle to descartes has given us lot of instances of novelty and also instances of creativity instances of creativity which is the biggest achievement very very big achievement and then you have as i said emmanuel kant who says that self is the only repository of knowledge is the only agent that can have knowledge nothing else can have knowledge so the point that kesi bhattacharya krishna chandra bhattacharya asks in his very famous essay the concept of philosophy is if self is the only source of knowledge only repository of knowledge then do how do we know the self is it possible for us to know the self it is not that i know the other self that i know okay i know the other self but it is not that it is is it possible for the self that knows the external world to know about itself according to kesi bhattacharya there is no answer to this question because kant has not raised this question now you find that the self having a knowledge is taken for granted in the western tradition and nobody except kesi bhattacharya raised this question that means if you wanted to know if you wanted to critique kant there are people in the west but there are also people in india who have come up with a very substantial critic of kant and then he evokes advaita where he says that advaita talks about self not only knowing the external world but is also repository of its own knowledge that's the stand that kant uh, kesi bhattacharya takes so kesi bhattacharya accuses kant of relapsing into agnosticism and you know the self is the central pillar of modernity so kesi bhattacharya is taking head on the very concept of modernity the entire project of modernity in, in this essay and is saying that this modernity is founded on blindness it is half blind that is it knows it sees the world but it can't see itself and that is a big 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 claim and that is right you know in in you know it comes from right from the state which borders you okay and then he is a king george professor at calcutta university okay a very important critic of kant 
So now, now I, I, I mentioned to you some of the critical postures, moments within the West from Socrates via Aristotle to Descartes and Kant. I also shifted you, moved you away from the West and brought you to India, particularly to Kolkata with Kesi Bhattacharya. Now I wanted to try something different. What I wanted to try is what are we teaching in India in the departments of philosophy? Or from the student's point of view, what are students learning in philosophy departments in India? We are in raising this question, I want to not only discuss criticism as thinking, critical thinking, criticizing the agency, as I mentioned to you in the debate between KC Bhattacharya and Kant, but also critiquing the pedagogy. Should we receive should to students of philosophy in India receive philosophy that is taught to them or should they have a critical attitude? You know, alternatively, the question that I wanted to ask is when the present teachers of philosophy where students of philosophy, when present teachers of philosophy, where students of philosophy, how many of us had critical attitude towards what we have learned? So there are two things that the present day student is receiving something from the teacher and she will transmit this learning to her students in the next generation. Is it clear? Now the question that I want to ask you is that the present generation of teachers, when they were students, or let me just you know, restart, restate it like this, the present generation of teachers who are teaching what they are teaching, did they had a critical attitude towards what was taught to them when they were students or they passively received it? How many of us ask that question, why is this taught to me? more arrogantly, more arrogantly, did we ask our teachers, did you have a critical engagement with the syllabus that you are teaching to me when you are a student? Many problems associated with philosophy in India that it is not popular, people are not taking seriously and all these things are because we have kept criticism at the lowest level. If we had asked these questions, I'm sure the departments of social sciences, department of sciences would have paid attention towards this. Since we did not have, we did not display this critical attitude to what we are teaching to our students or what was taught to us when we were students, 
this lack of criticism is something that is damaging the subject philosophy in India. The reason why I bring in pedagogy is as um, you know, Mayuri um, very clearly mentioned when I was doing this, uh, you know, UPG partshala, you know, content uh, kind of a thing. I realized that many teachers were not ready to write lessons. Now, I cannot understand that because if you are teaching a course for several years, okay, so you know what you are teaching. So if you are teaching a course, you need maybe, you know, six months to put down your what you taught your students in a paper, write a lesson. Writing a lesson is different from writing a seminar paper. If you are writing a paper for a seminar, you have to display something new. But writing down what you are already taught, I don't think. And then to my utter shockingly surprising thing, I realized that more than 75% of money that is spent, resources that are spent in India was on Western philosophy. Less than 25% faculty or Indian philosophy people and the money spent seminars and all the things were Indian philosophy. But the number of lessons that I received in Indian philosophy were more than what I received from the Western philosophy. In fact, if you go to the website, you can see Indian Metaphysics by Pradeep Gokhale. All the lessons are done. Indian logic is done. But Western logic? But what is the logic? You know, you know what, is, what is taught in logic in India? Western logic. Symbolic logic or traditional logic. So if it is taught for such a long time and it is not, uh, and people are not writing it, I thought, I was very surprised. I'm, I'm still wondering, you know, why this happens. The reason why it happens is that we have not been critical about our practices. If the present generation of students do not become critical, they will, in turn, when they become teachers, they will do the same thing. And I am, even if at the cost of being very unpopular, I say, most of us did the same thing you know, in our own case. That's the reason why this is what is happening. So now, the other point that I wanted to uh, present to you is, now, if you are in, if you look at Indian philosophy departments, in philosophy departments in India, the syllabus consists of Western philosophy, Yes, is there any department of philosophy which doesn't teach Western philosophy? Okay. And in addition to it, we do teach Indian philosophy. Yes or no? So what is the proportion? 50-50? We do think about it. Is it 50-50? Why? Did you ever raise it? You know, uh, uh, why is the, what is the percentage of your syllabus? Did you ever raise it in your department? Why are we teaching? What is the, what is the justification for the proportion of Western philosophy and Indian philosophy in my university or college syllabus? Did you ever raise this question? Forget about, you know, having more or less. Is proportion a problem or not? In philosophy, if you don't raise these questions, who will raise it for you? Who will raise it for you? Do you think it is important for you to raise this question? Let me provoke you more. If you are in a Western philosophy department, what is taught there, Western philosophy? In America, philosophy departments teach Western philosophy? Yes or no? Do they ever teach Indian philosophy there? Yes.
know all the people who do Indian philosophy or in religious departments because they think that Indian philosophy is, is nothing but religion. There is no philosophy in India. So they made us believe that philosophy means only Western philosophy. Okay? I have no problem with it. If philosophy means only Western philosophy, that is why Indian philosophy is not taught in Western universities. I have no problem. My problem is with regard to the following. And that is, if Indian philosophy is not considered by Western departments of philosophy as philosophy, why are we teaching Indian philosophy in India? You understand? I'm not saying you should teach Indian philosophy. I'm saying you're teaching Western philosophy and you look at Western philosophers in their department, they teach only Western philosophy. They don't teach Indian philosophy. The reason why they don't teach Indian philosophy is because they don't consider in, you know, it, it to be a philosophy. And I agree with them. If they don't consider it as Western philosophy, philosophy, then what is problematic for me is why should I teach what they don't consider as philosophy, as philosophy in India? Unless I have a justification, I am indulged in non-critical thinking. I am in fact practicing orthodoxy. I am a traditionalist. I am a one who obeyed authority and asked and, and stopped asking critical questions. So the criticism, critical thinking is not in the air, you know, it is not, you know, Frankfurt School or things like that. You know, critical thinking has to come into, in, into, into, into this uh, specific instances. So, <clears throat> so, um, yeah. how much more time do I have? To you, sir. It's up to you. No, 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 that can't be, that is, that is, <laughs> that very oppressive, you know, you have any time. <laughs> Continue. Uh, 10 minutes? No, no. No, you you can spare your time according to your need. But madam, can you, you uh, tell me, uh, you know, some number. <laughs> okay, then 15 minutes, sir. Okay. Well, I'll, um, <laughs> then uh, it'll be less. Uh, I'll, I'll stop at 25. Okay, 625. Okay, fine. 25 or 24. Yeah. So, it is this that brought me to the following question. The following question is that if Western philosophers brand concluded that there is no philosophy in India and that is why they don't teach Indian philosophy in their philosophy departments. And they encourage you to be in the, uh, you know, except one or two places here and there, you know, it's not much, uh, okay. They, are, they, 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 they accommodate you in religious department, in uh, anthropology department, in history departments and things like that. Then the question that I wanted to raise and explore is the following. And that is, let us project a different Indian philosophy. See, they said that we projected Indian philosophy as A. And they found that A is not philosophy. That's why they don't teach there. Now, we can just agree with them or we will leave them 
and disobey them and then still teach what they did not consider as philosophy as in the philosophy department and go ahead. That's a different thing. That's what happens. But I think that is a very debunking the critical question, not practicing criticism. Okay. I wanted to pursue an alternative and that is the following. The following is, I wanted to revisit to look whether there is any philosophy other than what is projected to them as philosophy from India. So this is what brings me to the following. And what is it? I wanted to present before you three moments in the classical times, which are not they do not, these three moments do not figure in the textbooks of Indian philosophy. They don't become philosophy. And that I find them very, very, very important. The first moment is in Upanishads. The Upanishads are, 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 are presented in Indian philosophical text as discussing the relationship between Atman and Brahman. Is that the main uh, theme? Atman and Brahman is the main theme. Whenever we teach Upanishads, we talk about, you know, Atman, Brahman, Brahman, Atman, all kinds of things. Now, I want to set aside for the reason that I mentioned to you earlier, because this topic, Western philosophers found that it's not a Indian philosophy. It's not a philosophy. So I want to set aside that and then see if there is something else in Upanishads. And I find the following. And what is it that I find? I find not only the contents of Upanishads, namely Brahman and Atman, but three more important aspects. One is, I'm interested in looking at who is speaking in Upanishads? Not what is spoken. Who is speaking in Upanishads? How many of them are women and how many of them are men? So gender. What is the caste? breakup is it that there is only one caste which is speaking or there are others so i'm interested in knowing not just what is spoken in Upanishads, but who is the speaker two not what is spoken in Upanishads but to whom it is spoken, to whom it is spoken. It's a dialogical form, okay? It's not a doctrine. And most importantly, the third one, what is the nature of the narration, not the contents of the narration? Not what is the, what are the contents? The contents of the narration are covered already, Brahman and Atman. Not what is the content of narration, but what is the nature of the narration. In the nature of the narration, I find a, a, a crucial aspect of this narration is inquiry. If you look at the passages after passages in Upanishads, all of them reverberate not with final truths, but they're all rinsed in inquiry. That is something that is fascinating me because the final truths are closures. Inquiry is an open-ended. And this open-endedness has enormously seduced me while reading Upanishads. 
is my first moment. And when we teach our students open sets, is there any text which covers these three aspects? Hmm? Does anybody, you know, any book covers these three aspects of who is speaking, to whom it is spoken, and what is the nature of the narration? Yes or no? Anybody? And why? Isn't it interesting? You know, it is of an enormous interesting because you read the 31 and 32 dialogues of Plato. How many women are there? How many women are there? There is a mention of one woman called Dimitri, who is the teacher of Socrates. Mention of her. She is not there. In comparison, look at women in they are not more, they are not 50%, but they are not less in comparison to, you know, it is an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing for me. So that's where I wanted to present an alternative Indian philosophy to the West and ask them whether you think that this is a philosophy from India and you think that it can be taught there. Let me quick, I am just running out of time. So let me take the second moment. The second moment is another person who is never mentioned substantially, but is the major contributor in Indian philosophy is Badarayana. One of the most important thing is he is the first compiler in the world. And in compiling from uh, uh, Vedanta Sutras, he has followed a method. He has given us a method of compiling. Okay? And the interesting thing about Badarayana is that in India, we know about the interpreters of Vedanta Sutras, but not the compiler of Vedanta Sutras. So what do we teach in our courses? We teach Shankara, Ramanuja, Valva, and uh, uh, you know all these things. I see, but what are they interpreting? What is the text from where these interpretations come? Badarayana. Do you teach Badarayana in your uh, Indian philosophy course? Anybody teaches? Why, man? Why? You don't like him? He is not a Bhashyakara. He is a Sutrakara. He is a foundational and you know, a contributor and you don't teach him. You think it's good? And as I told you, he is the first compiler the world has produced. Okay? I'm not going to the details because of lack of time. The last one, Gaudapada. Gaudapada is the first comparativist the world has produced. And what he was comparing is not two similar things. He's not a, like an analogy. He was comparing two incompatible systems. Vedanta and its rival Buddhism. Okay? It is almost like squaring the circle. It is like connecting A and not A. Which is a most difficult thing. And it does this job wonderfully. Wonderfully. And this is the, you know, he produces a wonderful, nice film and we have not seen it. And who is a loser? Not Gaudapada, but we. How many of you teach Gaudapada, mention Gaudapada in Indian philosophy? And why, ma'am? You don't like him? 
Have you, have you employed critical thinking about these people? Are you critical enough? Um, I mean, I'm telling you about these people and I'm, I'm telling you that since they are Indians, you know, you, you have to teach. No, I'm not telling you. I don't want you to take that in kind of a, you know, sympathetic attitude towards them. They're substantial thinkers. You know, they don't need you. You need them. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It may sound very arrogant, but I want to be arrogant. They don't need you, but you jolly well need them. If you don't use them, you are the big losers and the subject will get doomed. So this is the critical thinking that I wanted to. And then there are people like Vidushekar Bhattacharya, you know, who uh, interprets him as a Buddhist. There is Damodar Karmarkar, who interprets him as Vedanta, Vedanti. You know, somebody is bridging a big, uh, building a bridge between two rival groups. And then you dismantle it saying that, no, the bridge belongs to this side or that side. Does it make sense? Where does the bridge make sense? When it connects two different places or it belongs to this side or that side? Where? You know, I, you know, Gauhati is a, you know, wonderful place. It's a beautiful place. I've, um, I've been to Gauhati and, uh, you know, I'm going to, um, um, Nehu and things like that. Now there are a lot of bridges. Okay. Imagine that the people of this side says, this bridge is ours. I will take it. The other people of that side says, this is our bridge. I will pull it this side. Does it make sense? And most importantly, <clears throat> why are we not even mentioning Gaudapada? And the task that he has undertaken, is it a small task? Is an insignificant thinker? Who is responsible for making Indian philosophy what it is today? And the reason why we are making is, we have lost that critical thinking. We have lost that critical thinking. Unless we become critical of these things, it will be just one. Ah, was Prabhashankar. What do you tell me? No. No, I am in a lecture now. Is it urgent? Okay, fine. Okay. okay. So, uh, sorry, so it is this uh, critical thinking that we have uh, missed, missed. So when Dr. Maitre Sharma asked me that I should speak on critical thinking, maybe she thought that I will speak about uh, Frankfurt School and uh, all that kind of a thing. But then I thought that uh, I should uh, accept her uh, theme, but turn it the way in which I want to turn it. Yeah. Thank you so much for this, giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. It's wonderful, really illuminating. We have learned so many things, really illuminating, sir. Thank you. Uh, now the so session is open for discussion. If you have any questions, you can ask, but be brief. You may ask question. We have our students also here. You can also ask question. Uh, Rip Jyoti, do you want to ask? Uh, yes, ma'am. You have raised hand. That's why yes, I'm asking. 
hello sir uh, hello everyone uh, sir i want to ask you a question and it is uh, sir as we are student i would like to ask you how can we uh, develop or inculcate uh, the skill of critical thinking sir i mean i give you one model yes sir that don't go and fight with your teacher and say that no this is useless and that's not a point of uh, it is not a personal attack you have to read what is prescribed to you read it them then identify the underlying track of your reading locate its nature locates its nature and then see what is missing what is missing so this talk is not meant for you know inciting students to fight with the teachers and <laughs> this talk is basically meant for making students to go after the like after the class to the library and read more so there is a i will me just caution you know they should not be thinking that no this is not to is an excuse to bunk classes this adds more responsibility where you attend classes learn what is taught to you and then go to library read more okay um uh, yes. may i ask yeah thank you so much uh thank you professor raghuram raju uh, for a wonderful uh, lecture i am little confused and i'm sure that uh, your response uh, will make me little more enlightened first of all uh, i've got you right uh, you uh, mentioned that westerners they don't teach indian philosophy because they don't treat uh, indian philosophy as philosophy and they club it with religion uh, i i have a little problem with this uh, perspective maybe it is their opinion and they have full freedom to uh, treat others perspective uh, their own uh, uh, vision and wisdom uh but still when we think of critical thinking the way that you have given us three moments and there are departments whereby uh, you know badrayan is also taught and but of course he is not you are right maybe uh, that they he is not taught as uh, you know a sutrakar as a compiler yes that awareness is yet to arise uh, among the teachers also and uh, as a pedagogy we must introduce our students uh, that who is a sutrakar what is a sutra what is the definition of a sutra so these intricacies can be worked upon uh, i completely agree but my further uh, worry is that when you say that uh, this is how you know uh, when we talk of gender issues when we talk of uh, women issue finally you have shown that there are number of uh, women thinkers also rishikas rishikas that we um, call them uh, but when you say that mm, i mean the west does not accept indian philosophy as philosophy that is my concern that is somehow you know it hurts a bit what is philosophy for them when we see greek philosophy the problem of self has perturbed all the good minds all the uh, you know visionaries they have been really perturbed with this concept of self and upanishads are full are they, they are a full fledged discourse on this concept so uh, if they think if the present day modern uh, analytical uh, tradition thinks that philosophy or philosophical bent of mind or attitude is simply analytical skills then i think uh, we really need to redefine that indian philosophy uh, is little much more than uh, you know uh, analytical skills and leads us to some their uh, realization of self also so maybe uh, there is no uh, commonality on this ground that indian philosophy is to be recognized by the westerners uh, as philosophy at all 
uh, I mean, um, I hope that I was not very naive, but if you find my question, uh, I can, I, I think that you can re-modify my question and query. Thank you. I'll be highly obliged if you respond to this. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much for asking that question. <laughs> there are a couple of things that I wanted to respond to. Um, though I projected this as, um, uh, you know, um, this new thinkers, I mean, the, these, the, this, this, you know, uh, uh, these, these three moments uh, as if I'm presenting it to them, to the West, to take us seriously. I'm not bothered about them. India is a subcontinent. When I make these things, I raise these, suppose if I say, teach these things, you, are, you will say that, you know, I'm an orthodox fellow. I have located it in that fire, but it is not meant to burn. I don't want to burn these important thinkers there. I want to bring them into our syllabus so that our understanding of Indian philosophy becomes rejuvenated. That's my first thing. Second thing is, see, I don't want uh, these philosophers to be uh, part of uh, analytical uh, uh, departments of West because First of all, if you look at philosophy in the West, it is undergoing a big crisis. The way in which science and technology has blasted them, blasted philosophy in the West, starting from Kant, it is very clear about it. And they are all trying to survive from this onslaught of science, dominance of science and uh, capitalism and things like that. So when they are in a crisis, to ask them to include us, you know, is uh, is not a correct thing. So I don't want to be in the departments. I don't want to do. I don't want to be in the uh, in the departments of analytical philosophy, which are already in a crisis. If you, we have assumed that they have an authority. I find that they have no authority. They have no power. They have resources, but they are under crisis. They are under a lot of stress there. The other thing that I find is that that is the first point that you mentioned. You might teach Badarayana in your course. There may be departments that discuss them. But the point that I'm making, I'm making this point very shortly. If you don't present Badarayana as a Sutrakara, it is just missing the entire, you know, uh, and an entire mountain of knowledge, mountain of knowledge. You might just, you know, resolve another thing is the mere details, which I can always dispense with. So you may have 10 courses on Badarayana in, you know, 5,000 departments of philosophy in India. But if that does not have the Sotrakar element, it doesn't interest me. I might sound very arrogant, but be that it, it is. Thank you, sir. Then Jima Kolita, uh, you raised hand. Do you have any questions? Jima Kolita? So, yeah. So um, students of philosophy are finding it's difficult to uh, find its place in the society compared with the other department students or other course students. So sir, do you think there is a way to improve ourselves uh, to um, work with the society, our ongoing and uh, developing society with our course? Yeah, it's good that you asked this question and thank you to you for this. If people in India do not find philosophy interesting, it is good. I'm very happy they're honest. Because the way in which philosophy is done, if they are interested, there is something wrong with them. Okay, so if you revise these things, if you, you know, be critical about your pedagogy, you come up with, you know, I mean, address to the kind of a things that are there in front of you, make, I mean, Kant was responding to the kind of uh, changes that are taking place in, in Europe. Okay, so if you come up with that kind of engagement, 
and if they still don't take you seriously then i will respond to it differently but today as you mentioned rightly if they don't find philosophy interesting india i don't find anything wrong with that in fact they have been very honest you should be thankful for them thank you sir thank you jima tonuja yelle and good you sir ma'am am i audible yeah uh, thank you sir for the great lecture here sir i have a very simple question uh, to ask you sir uh, is it possible to think critically about any concept or uh, or any idea before i understand it fully and if uh, no then how do i think critically about something while i am still trying to understand it yeah uh, good that you asked this which is not a simple question it is a simple but frightening to be you know uh, <laughs> a sequence is very important tanuja if criti criticism precedes understanding it will go heavy that's why you remember i said that criticism should not become a habit it should not become an obsession it should not become a disease this is what i had in mind when i said this when you come up with a concept you have to go around that concept like you do pradarshana in the religious places and understand it even if the concept says that you you know why are you again reading me you should not leave it and once you start understanding you know when you start understanding a concept when you realize the boundaries of the concept when you realize the boundaries of the concept when you start realizing the boundaries of the concepts then you will understand its nature its extent and then you can point out the limitations and be critical but if you start with criticism it will not take you in any it is better that you know you, you remain orthodox thank you sir sir may i may i ask one more question along with that yes. sir when we uh, go for any critical thinking course it is always taught as if it is a logical reasoning course sir why is that approach there always i mean i do understand the importance of logical reasoning in the critical thinking but critical thinking will it not come with problem solving sir that's what i say that uh, when uh, when i read when i when i attend this uh, uh, courses on logic logical reasoning modes of reasoning and all that thing <clears throat> the way in which they delivered or very very you know unreflective unreflective they delivered as if you know they are the final pieces okay instead i wanted to explore where these ideas these these tools of reasoning these tools of critical thinking are used with certain concepts okay not as present it to you as theory and you present in turn these things to your your students as theory you know that is the this is like you know this is a transmission of knowledge not use of knowledge thank you tonuja so jutika has yes, sir thank you ma'am raised her hand so this will be our last question because sir has another meeting to join jutika Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for your wonderful lecture. Uh, I just want to have a little bit clarity uh, one regarding one more thing. Uh, you have talked about the rejection of Indian philosophy by the Western universities. Okay, but uh, being an Indian, I think it's our duty to save 
Indian philosophy or we should pursue Indian philosophy or practice. So uh, in order to save that, uh, I, as per my understanding, we have to have the justification. We have to give the justification. And for giving that justification, there is a requirement of critical thinking. So I just want to get the clarity. Is it, am I uh, right, sir? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, except that, okay. you know, I don't want to use the word saving Indian philosophy. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, Indian philosophy should not be saved. Mm. It should be presented like a hot cake so that the other person brings a plate to serve it in, in their plate. Don't give it as a cold kind of a thing and they will take it and then throw it at your face. Okay, okay. It and die. Mm. Burn it like a fire. So when they see your concepts are on fire, they have to bring their plate and bring a spoon or spoke to carefully transfer it into their plate and handle it very carefully. And that is your job. Okay. And it can be done. And that's how Western philosophy has enticed us. When they served Western philosophy, they served it as a hot thing. You know, we have to go with our plates. This is our turn. Okay, uh, sir, thank you uh, for the clarification. One more thing. So is there any relation, sir, between critical thinking and skepticism? Like skepticism, uh, critical thinking are leading to skepticism? Is one aberration or one aspect of critical thinking. Critical thinking need not necessarily relapse into skepticism. Thank you, Jutika. Thank you, sir. Paramita's question will be our last question. Paramita. Paramita, unmute Hello, hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for your deliberation. Your deliberation is really thought provoking and I'm completely agree with you. Uh, but it is hurting me a little bit as I'm interested in Indian philosophy and uh, knowing that the Western philosopher, Western th thinkers do not consider it as philosophy. Uh, so now my, uh, but as a religion, now I, my question is that, is not it uh, that our religion is itself philosophical as uh, when Vivekananda introduced Hinduism in the West, then it was very much appreciated. It, it may be that as they do not study Indian philosophy, so they do not know the depth of it. So it is just an inquiry. Can it be, sir? Can it be like that, yeah. sir? Yeah, you're good that you are raised. But then, you know, what did we do to Vivekananda? Did we study Vivekananda philosophically? There is only one philosopher that I know who took Vivekananda and others philosophically serious and that is Ramchandra Gandhi. Nobody else, you know, philosophized, you know, here and there, you know, there is some discussion about Gandhi, some discussion about Tagore and this kind of thing. <laughs> A philosophical engagement of these people has not taken place. I mean, forget about the contemporary. I mentioned to you, to you about the inquiry in Upanishads, comparison in Badarayana, uh, uh, compilation in Badarayana, and comparison in Kaudapada. Did you come across these things earlier, Paramita? No, sir. Why, ma'am? There are no books. There are no books of uh, Badarayana. Forget about West. Look at what we have done to our own, you know, resources. Just forget about West. You know, I mean, I refer to West only to, you know, otherwise they, you might call me. I am propagating Indian philosophy. No, that, that that's why, you know, I want to get out of the tag, which is a, you know, if I have not referred to Western philosophy uh, point, uh, half of you would have pounced on me saying that no, you are promoting Indian philosophy. Now I have scuttled you. I have stopped that that group of people to raise questions to me by this. But eventually I am not interested in them. 
I am interested in the intellectual resources of the subcontinent. I want to reach to you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paramita. Thank now, you, uh, may I request my colleague Devusri Koshi to propose vote of thanks. And welcome, Sarbari Vado. Sarbari Vado is also with us. Welcome. Now, Devusri, you propose vote of thanks. Sir. Uh, anything else you you would like to share, or we we can we are going to conclude. Sir, sir. Yeah. Do, do you have anything? Oh, no, no, thank, thank you. Ah, should we conclude? Okay, Devasri, you can give your voice. Good evening, everyone. It is a great honor and privilege for me to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the. Department of Philosophy, Pandu College. Our end of the lecture series has become very special by the presence of our chief guest, Professor A. Raghuramaraju, Department of Humanities and Social Science, IIT Tirupati. On behalf of the Pandu College family, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to our chief guest, Professor Raghur Amaraju, who has graced the occasion with his enlightening speech. We have expressed our deep sense of gratitude to ICPR, which has sponsored our program. Without your most generous contribution, it is not possible for us to conduct such a wonderful event. Our sincere gratitude goes to our respected principal, Dr. Jugis Kakoti for his inaugural speech and his constant support to organize this program. We are thankful to our respected vice principal, Dr. Sarbari Roy and Dr. Sirin Banu. We are especially grateful to all our respected speakers for next lectures, Professor Nobokumar Hendik and Dr. Sivani Sorma and all dignitaries for their gracious presence and encouragement in this lecture. Our heartfelt thanks goes to respected faculty members from different departments and the research scholars for making this event a successful one. We have appreciated and offered our gratitude to our dear students for their participation in this lecture series. We are specially indebted to Dr. Sansai Juti Bora and Dr. Gauri Sankar Karmakar for their constant support and help for arranging such a wonderful event. Our special thanks goes to today's reporter, Orpita Day, for her support. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you once again, sir, and thank you all respected participants for your active participation. Thank you, madam, for uh, this thing. Thank you. Sometimes we will meet again.